as the world came to a standstill, as every door was closed. I had a feeling that was precisely the time when the world needed art the most. I turned to the stories that adorned my walls, that hid in the corners of my shelves, that peeked through empty corridors. Art is the window through which I have been fortunate to see throughout my entire life. And it is that very window that I decided to open up for everyone, everywhere. The museum we were building was transformed in a way where the stories it was meant to hold could enter the homes of all those who sought it through this very window, like bursts of morning light. It enabled all of us here to look at an increasingly grim world as it seemed to us then, with both hope and possibility. Art reminds us that many plagues have come and gone, that no matter how dark it gets and no matter how heavy now feels, time will eventually turn all of us into stories and someone will always find us in a new dawn. In what took months but feels like minutes, we found ways to turn a darkness that was claustrophobic to one with flickers of light. The endless opportunities of the virtual world became a canvas for us to reach audiences, have conversations, share ideas, and above all, remind ourselves of the unique perspectives that art has always shared on our everyday lives. Here we are at yet another beginning to open those very doors that we then had to close. Today, this iconic building by Matthew and Ghosh is to become the heart and soul of a canvas that has already spread far and wide. MAP is a space that invites one and all. Not only will it hold a curation of great art from the diverse pantheon of artists from India's incredible heritage, but it will also be a space where we bring people from all walks of life to have their own dialogue with everything that sits inside of these walls. And as we grow each day, we are only filled with gratitude for all those who have supported us and continue to support us through this curious journey. It gives me no greater joy than to see my once solo voice turn into a symphony of song. Today, I welcome you and I look forward to seeing all of you coming here and making this space and all that it holds your very own. Art is life, or so we believe. So welcome to New Beginnings. Art is life, or so we believe. So welcome to New Beginnings. Art is not just objects in museums. Art is life. We want to take art right into the heart of the community. Art is not just... And remind people that art is everywhere in the drape of a sari, in the rice patterns we draw on our doorsteps, in our home shrines that we decorate every day. And at MAP, we are trying to build pathways that make these connections. So this is your museum, a place of storytelling, discovery and dialogue, of cultural exchange, where we learn from each other to build networks of knowledge. Our museum will be a platform for multiple voices. Not just the dominant ones, but also those that struggle to be heard. The building is visualized as an exciting cultural hub with five galleries spread over different levels, presenting exhibitions that are curated to interest different audiences, so there is something for everyone. The auditorium is an interactive space for talks, performance and video. Our learning centre is where we hope children will discover the joy of learning through the arts. We also offer a research library, a conservation centre and a cafe where you can catch your breath or catch up with friends.
Why do we choose the exhibitions that we do? To us, it is important to curate exhibitions that are relatable to larger audiences and that can be appreciated by all, whether it's through the artworks displayed, the stories revealed, or the themes explored. The museum hopes to be a space which allows for ideas, conversations and questions, rather than just a gallery of artworks. A central part of our mission at MAP is to bring art, culture and heritage to all of you, to make art more accessible and provide meaningful ways of engaging with visual culture. So how do we create enriching experiences for you? Let's take a quick peek. The Sculpture Courtyard features an exhibition of five works by Stephen Cox. These sculptures of rishis and yoganis draw from mythical beings. His works bring the ancient into the contemporary, both in form and material. The gallery on the ground floor, free to the public, showcases Chirag A. AI, which looks at works by artist Ellen Talur, who is from Karnataka. Drawing partly from Deepalakshmi and Kinara lamps in our collection, Talur combines artificial intelligence and ritual belief systems, challenging audiences to think and question the role that technology plays in our lives. The third floor of the museum features Time and Time Again, which looks at Jyoti Bhatt's photographic works, offering a personal insight into his life and artistic practice. The galleries on the fourth floor are dedicated to MAP's permanent show Visible Invisible, representations of women in art through the MAP collection. Through this exhibition, we hope you can explore and contemplate interrelated questions of gender, gender roles and power dynamics as visualized through the arts. The journey of an object from storage to display is a long one. Once chosen for the exhibition, they go to the conservation department for a checkup and are treated to make sure they are healthy for display. Wherever possible, we try to recreate the ways they were originally intended to be experienced. Before they move into the gallery, we work to create an optimal environment for these objects by controlling light, temperature and humidity. This is crucial to preserve these fragile, tangible pieces of heritage that we as museums are custodians of. Building an exhibition is a multidisciplinary and integrative process. From the designer to the carpenter, printer, painter, art handler and framer, we all work in tandem to bring an exhibition to life. Through the process of balancing space, artifacts and narratives, we try to create an immersive experience, leaving our visitors with a sense of curiosity and wonder. Art is an important part of the cultural landscape of any city. Art is something that, is, that needs to exist to be able to open people's perspective in multiple different directions. Mindscapes is a project undertaken by the Wellcome Trust and I'm an artist in residence at the Museum of Art and Photography. We are multiple artists who are working for this project and we are all trying to address what Mindscapes actually means to us, at the same time address the concerns around mental health. Mental health in India, there is a certain kind of taboo around it. With this project, I'm hoping to address and at the same time try and create these safe spaces where it is easy for us to express ourselves and at the same time 
use that space to kind of further talk about and bring more awareness about mental health to create the sense of community and to also know that we are there for each other. We do stitching activities where we sit together and stitch text and multiple different stories. We started with stitching their own name. The moment they start stitching, they see their name and then they feel the sense of identity, the sense of like, oh, I am not really had the time to see myself. And it's so beautiful to see. The act of stitching is also like repair, you know, there's a, there's a certain way in which we are trying to bring together and create a certain togetherness in the fabric of the city. With regards to the space, I'm working with six Anganwadis in the area. Anganwadis are government recognized bodies, which is primarily a scheme by the government to make sure that uh, women and children are taken care. So there are multiple different programs that run in these spaces, um, all the way from education to nutrition to taking care of uh, pregnant women. One of the things that we are also doing at these um, Anganwadis is installing swings so that the women have uh, a time to just be a child again, to be able to move away from family chores and house chores and to take some time off for themselves. It's a space of care. It's a space to slow down, to reflect, to share their stories. A lot of women are coming back and they keep coming back to us saying, um, let us know when the next workshop is, let us know when we can start working together again. As of today, I think we've had 200 uh, women have attended these workshops. Things cannot change overnight. For example, if mental health has very strong roots of having a certain kind of taboo, it's not going to happen overnight saying, okay, everything is going to change. It will take its own course and it will take its own time. But I do believe that art can make a change. Do museums keep in touch? Collaborating with cultural institutions opens up an avenue of possibilities. It's allowed us to engage with people who bring different perspectives to the table and find new ways to break down art and art history to a wider audience. Our collaborative series, Museums Without Borders, was really born out of the pandemic. At a time when physical travel and exhibitions were restricted, the project enabled artworks to travel virtually between institutions and for curators to find commonalities or differences between the artworks. Over the last two years, we've collaborated with over 21 museums in India and around the world. And this has let us explore a range of artworks spanning different mediums, styles, and periods. In the process of bringing artworks and collections together, we've unearthed some really interesting connections. How common motifs travel across time and cultures, or how artists inhabiting different continents might have shared a similar trajectory. Sometimes, looking at an artwork alongside another can also encourage new ways of seeing. But more than that, the project allows us to build bridges between institutions, we are very grateful to FedEx for their continued support in enabling this project and we look forward to opening our collections to new audiences. Today, we partner with the Philadelphia Museum of Art to look at two paintings. One by Henri Matisse from Philadelphia's collection and a painting by K.G. Subramanian from MAP's collection. Both works, although stylistically different, 
depict a common scene, a seated woman in an interior setting. Join us as we attempt to unpack this iconography featured in artworks stretching across styles and mediums. The man behind this painting, K.G. Subramanian, was a seminal figure in the landscape of modern Indian art. He worked across a variety of mediums, including terracotta murals, oil paintings, pottery, and sculpture. Alongside his artistic practice, he was also a celebrated writer, scholar, teacher, and art historian. Henri Matisse made many innovations in the areas of painting, drawing, printmaking, sculpture, and the illustrated book. This painting, entitled Breakfast, was made in 1920. It marks a transitional moment in Matisse's career. Not long before, he had relocated from Paris to Nice on France's Mediterranean coast. The picture was painted in a room where Matisse lived and worked in an establishment called the Hôtel de la Méditerranée, situated on the city's seafront promenade. On the other hand, Subramanian's work is not set within a specific geographical location. This work, titled Woman in the Blue Room, was painted in 1981, a time when he was experimenting with the reverse glass painting technique. He was particularly interested in the kitsch elements that were typical to these paintings. The vivacity of colors, the employment of bright pinks and light blue, which we also see in this work. The imagery of a seated woman in an interior setting is perhaps something that he encountered during his travels in Europe. Subramanian likely had exposure to the works of Matisse, and his stylistic idiom drew upon a wide range of influences, from the works of Picasso, Kali Ghatpats, and even Japanese woodcuts. Standing at the right edge of the composition, we see a patterned floor-to-ceiling window curtain. To the left is a table with a decorative skirt in white. On the table are two pots with flowers and an oval mirror framed in gold. Above, half cut off by the top of the composition, is a head and shoulders drawing of a woman, which could be a double for the real woman seated in the yellow chair in the middle ground. Seated in this chair is a hired artist model named Antoinette Arnoud. In front of her is a second table with a red and white striped tablecloth. And on that table in the foreground is a still life that gives the picture its title. A tray with a cup and saucer, a pot perhaps for tea, and a plate with lemons. Compositionally, we see some parallels between both works. Both works feature a seated woman with their heads resting on their hands amidst a backdrop that includes flowers and vases. In Subramanian's painting, the female figure is draped in a white sari with hints of cleavage, adding a sensual quality to the work. The rendering of her body and flesh also shows some affinity to the Kaligat style of painting. During the Industrial Age, Women's bodies were often linked to interiority. Women were seen as extensions of the interior, sometimes even blending into the decor. Scholarship suggests that the presence of flowers and vases in such settings were also markers of fecundity. Yet, Subramanian's take on this common iconography is often marked by a playful, almost subversive quality, and this recurs in his other works as well. Similarly, with breakfast, we see the construction of interiority in Matisse's painting. His way of rendering the space in this picture as a light fell box tells us something important about the direction of his work in 1920. Having gone through a period of very demanding and experimental painting, Matisse was now interested in turning towards refinement and sensuality. He was interested in painting spaces like the one in this picture as little pictorial worlds where he could explore the pleasures of pictorial depth, richness of detail, and the corporeality of the succession of female models whom he employed in daily painting sessions. The body of Antoinette Arnoux introduces an element of sensuality, but Matisse's conceit was to align her allure with the decorative patterns of everything else in the picture to create a unified effect across the surface of the canvas. 
Like Matisse, Subramanian too was interested in the construction of pictorial space. He began experimenting with the grid while in New York when he pieced together canvases, the result of a small studio space. Traces of the grid and at times a window-like setup continued within his paintings and terracotta works. The spatial configuration visualized in this painting is striking. The picture plane is effectively divided into three through the use of perpendicular lines as well as the flattening of volume. Subramanian's approach to space is structured and partitioned. The seated woman occupies the upper portion of the work, while the lower portion comprises an arrangement of flowers and bowls, akin to a still life. In conclusion, it's worth noting that here and in many other pictures of the period, Matisse makes a strong connection between the setting of the bedroom or boudoir, the figure of the model, and the psychology of absorption underscored in this picture by the theme of reading. Antoinette Arnoux looks up from her book, twists in her chair, and is caught in a moment of thought that could be melancholy or simply reverie. This disinterest is echoed in Subramanian's painting as well, and the construction of the interiors in both the works further accentuate their solitude. Locating these themes and motifs across geographical boundaries reflect how common iconographic constructions have been interpreted and visualized in the works of established artists across cultures. A group of uh, senior artists from Bangalore, they did a protest show on on the pavements of MG Road, marking that uh, you know that there's no gallery or a museum that can uh, you know accommodate or host contemporary artists, and that's how the government built Venkata Park Gallery in 1975. So it's very interesting in 45 years that uh, we have a you know a museum like map opening right in front of that, and it's so important that we have multiple spaces that are caters to different kinds of art genres. Art seems to be, especially contemporary art, seems to be very isolated at this point of time. It's with the notion that uh, somehow the community or the society don't understand it. These problems can be really kind of sorted out in an, in an, in an institution platform. I can play a role with an institution. I may not be able to do that within my own uh, studio practice, but um, given an opportunity to engage with an institution like that, which has its own system, structure, and capacity to bring different kinds of people together, there's entirely new kind of uh, art practices and uh, cultural meanings can be brought in. It can become a very interesting platform for collaboration between different uh, you know, disciplines. So there is an opportunity to create a very different kind of culture practice here. Just this two weeks of map opening, we saw a different kind of community coming into Bangalore City. We saw a different kind of people who are uh, appreciating our work or talking to us and interacting with that community. That uh, creates a new energy. What's in the map collection? Our vast growing collection of over 60,000 artifacts is at the very heart of the museum. It drives everything that we do at MAP. Currently, the collection is divided into six disciplines. Pre-modern art, modern and contemporary art, textiles, craft and design, photography, 
popular culture and living traditions. With our collection, we want to share the many stories of South Asian art and culture and explore new ways of looking at art. Our aim is to move away from the old school of categorization that existed to find new narratives. We want to bridge the gap between what is perceived as high and low art by including objects that may not usually be a part of a museum collection. The magical thing about art is that it can be viewed and enjoyed in many ways. And the pandemic has really helped us all realize this. Through the course of the lockdown, we developed a new collections management system with the MAP technology team called Cumulus. Staying committed to our core mission of accessibility, we have digitized more than 9,000 objects from our collection, which can be accessed on the MAP website. We can proudly say that we are one of the fewest museums in India to have a substantial chunk of our collection online. We are currently working very hard to make our entire collection digital for you. An archivist's role at a museum is to make sure that the heart of the body that is, the collection of the museum remains alive and healthy. One needs to look after the collection in terms of creating an intricately documented archive, researching and recording information about the artworks, taking care of its storage and well-being. It is to know the artworks in and out, and it is this knowledge that is central to the various activities in a museum. For example, in the upcoming exhibition on Jyoti Bhatt, the meticulously archived collection laid the path to view the photographer's artistic journey and understand his work from multiple viewpoints. It let us travel with him step by step, letting us look into his thought process, his influences, the evolution and diversification of his practice. We are really excited that it's all finally come together and we hope that you will enjoy it as much as we did while putting it together. I think what compelled me was just how unabashed it is and its strength. It is work that is unafraid. The works are built up of one knot after another knot, so it's about patience. She's not a weaver, she's not working off a loom. You can feel that gravity wears upon these works, like they're pulled to the ground. They're not light and ethereal, but they're full-figured and they're full-bodied. She was very interested in the performative arts. Theo, Kathakali, and what she was interested in was the masks the costumes. She's marrying human features of a mask with the fanning opening of a serpent's head. She was interested in the Nag Devtas, the serpent deities that you see adorning so many temples across India. You can sense a relation between her sculpture and those forms but there is no literal replication. As she says, they're not iconic representations of any particular religious belief, but they're parallel invocations in the realm of art. When you go into the Sanctum Centorium of any sacred space and you come upon an iconic presence, you feel a sense of awe. 
and she wanted that for her works. With Bakshi, you can see it's larger than life. You're awed by its presence. There are a remarkable number of recesses, folds. You almost kind of sense mobility or motion that's rippling, surging. A lot of these profusions of folds call out to the vulva or vaginal forms. There is a kind of vital life force. She wanted the works to be chromatically very exuberant. The chemical dyes added that other level of artifice that connects to a, a tradition of modernist art practice. She drew up installation instructions. It speaks to a kind of fastidiousness, but also an awareness of how sculpture is apprehended in space. They have such a weight and physical presence when you see them. They really announce themselves. She wanted your sensorium to be completely um, activated. She brings in a modernist sensibility with the symmetry and the formal precision, but marries that with a crafting sensibility. And then you have classical iconography. So she's really moving across so many different registers, formal, art historical, aesthetic. When you see the work, you know you're looking at a Murnali Mukherjee without question. We lose out a considerable amount of our cultural heritage because of climate conditions or lack of attention and knowledge. At MAP, we wish to protect India's tangible heritage as much as we can. MAP's conservation team, in a nutshell, safeguards the collection and is always learning new techniques and methods of conservation across media and materials. Other than caring for MAP's own collection, we also reach out to other cultural institutions and facilitate the care of their collections. We want to build up a space that protects and preserves India's cultural heritage on a whole, which goes beyond just restoring our collection. The idea is for museums and institutions to come together and preserve artwork for future generations. We want to spread awareness about the important role of art conservation and restoration. There are multiple global debates on what defines a museum. However, there is one fundamental element that remains consistent across these ideas of what a museum should be, and that is its role as a public institution of learning. From the very start, museums have been associated with curiosity, with wonder, and with knowledge building. And this is also key to how we define our museum here at MAP. Our work in education and outreach forms the bridge between all of the very exciting content that we house, our collections, our exhibitions, and our audiences. On site at the museum, which we're very excited to kick off now with our public opening, off site, beyond the museum walls, and online to freely share knowledge and experience worldwide.
And with all of our educational initiatives and public programs, whether it's our work with schools and educators, children, people with disabilities, our online resources, public talk series, or our video content, we are constantly striving to create an environment where people can build connections among ideas and objects, art and their daily lives. We believe that art can truly change minds, hearts and lives, teaching us to rethink the ways in which we perceive not only ourselves, but the world around us. What is art integrated learning and how can it help you? Involvement in the arts can help produce well-rounded individuals and we believe in starting them young. Introducing children to the joys of art and culture early can do wonders for academic and emotional development because it really sparks curiosity and creative thinking. At MAP Education, we work with young people across age groups, backgrounds as well as learning abilities and develop programs that draw from the vast range of the collection. We have been running workshops with school groups since 2016. They may take the form of visits to the MAP Education Centre or outreach programs to schools and have today grown to become a part of the yearly calendar of many a schools in Bengaluru and beyond. Since the pandemic, we have been running sessions online and developing a self-exploratory digital resource that we call Discover Map. Discover Map really is for everybody, whether you're 10 or 50. Each pack explores a theme or artist from the map collection and can act as great family bonding sessions where everyone comes together to look at art and have conversations around it. We also launched an exciting new series called Art Sparks that is curated especially for young audiences. One of our recent seasons features a young person in conversation with the education team about artworks from the collection. Hi, I'm Bhairav and for this season of Art Sparks, I was asked to pick eight objects from the map collection that I was really curious about or had many, many questions about. And I'm Shilpa. Today we are going to be looking at this incredible textile that Bhairav has chosen for us and try to answer many of his questions. So, welcome to Art Sparks. What were your first impressions of this textile, Bhairav? Well, I thought it was very interesting and very different from like the usual textiles that I've seen mm -hmm. because there's just so much going on yeah. and you can see that every single element in this textile is different from the other. You're entirely right that each of them are like different a little bit in some sense or the other. Yeah. And this is uh, effectively because it, it's a handmade thing, Yeah. right? So this is actually an embroidered textile. Yeah, that's what I thought because everything is different. Mm -hmm. So that's not usually how things are printed. So Yeah. If you look closely, you can kind of see the, um, the base cloth, right? And what do you think it would feel like to touch? Well, it looks a bit rough. It's definitely not smooth at all. Yeah. Because it's, it's quite separated. Even the embroidery and all the figures, it looks quite rough to, mm -hmm. to touch. Mm -hmm. This type of embroidery uses what is called khadar okay. uh, as its base uh, in general. And that's like a hand-woven, hand-spun, um, hand-dyed right. uh, material as well. And you're totally right, it's, it's always coarse. Um, you can also actually see here, you see this like line, right? Right. Going through. Um, and that's, and you see another one there. Yeah. So it also tells you actually that this is not one large piece of cloth. Mm. So they've actually stitched together three panels, right? Mm. Uh, to make up this, this very big shawl that you see in front of you. Yeah. Another super interesting thing about this tradition is that they actually do the embroidery from the back. So they do it on the reverse. Okay. So if you look closely, you can see kind of just how you only see the outline. Right. Right. And that's the really like cool part, but also the super painstaking part mm. because they would have to count each of the threads on this base cloth. Like, and they count the warp and the weft, <laughs> you know, as they kind of draw the figure or stitch um, the actual designs that they want. Mm. And if you lose count, 
you know, then it kind of basically will, um, it won't end up the way you want it to. So it takes, like it really takes a long time and a lot of patience to make this happen. I like how detailed it is because of that, like um, if you think how every single like tiny line of thread is like painstakingly put and they yeah. have put like so many minutes into that, uh, into like counting each one, it makes the detail seem even more and uh, I like the theme as well, like in the center you can see these three, um, everyone else seems to be like revolving around there maybe That's and I kind of think of them as like a father, a mother and like a child. So I've heard in Rajasthan there's a village that celebrates the birth of a girl child okay. by planting a tree. Oh. So like there's the celebration that comes. So this kind of reminds me of that. So if you take this as a father, mother and a child, maybe the child is just born and maybe like everyone is celebrating that, you know, kind of like a, like a scene that they're showing with this whole thing. It uh, reminds me of that. Yeah, that's, that's a really nice interpretation. So this is a tradition called Fulkari, which literally means flower work. Okay. Uh, fulkari. Mm. And it comes from the region of Punjab. So Punjab, both in India and Pakistan, so what used to be like East Punjab and West Punjab, it's practiced there. And it does have links to like this idea of gift giving and celebration, right? Okay. So it's, it's actually quite an important part of like weddings in Punjab. Um, part of gifts that are given to the bride, mm. part of wedding trousseaus and they would also make these uh, fulkaris to to give to relatives, um, you know, give to their children. Mm. So it does have a long history um, and can be very much seen in that spirit of celebration that you're talking about. Right. So uh, we talked about how it's handmade, right? So who usually makes fulkari? That's a really good question. So the, the fulkaris are actually made by the women of the household. Okay. And it's this kind of like, in many ways, it's a collective making process. So you would have like all of the women coming together. And obviously we've discussed that this is a very labor intensive sort of <laughs> like job, um, but they would do that in their leisure time, right? So right. actually they their leisure time was, was not a very leisurely activity, <laughs> but, um, they kind of had like, you know, it was also space for them to sort of unwind, mm. to talk to each other, they would sing songs and work. Um, and it's this whole space where within like homes, right, um, they were making these. Right. It was also part of generally the growing up uh, sort of, you know, the the rite of passage for young girls who would learn how to do the embroidery from their mums, their grandmums. Mm. So, coming back to this idea then, if we're, if we're talking about the birth of a child right. and this being a celebration, um, maybe we can look a little bit more, what do you think, um, you know, something like this? Like, what do you think <laughs> this would have to do with the celebration? What I do don't you think that is? I have no clue what that has to do with the celebration. But all I can think of is this being like a snout, these being ears, those being wings. So it's maybe like a, a fairy and it's a boar. A boar? <laughs> a boar fairy, you know, that they're calling the best, the child's. It's interesting that you thought this is a wand because I was actually thinking this is a flower. Mm. And like if you look at that one there, right, with the like star on the top. Oh yeah. I thought that was like maybe like a wand. <laughs> so there's there's a lot of stuff to see, right? What do you think this is? Uh, I can't think of anything except a table tennis racket and a brain job. I don't know what either of them are doing here. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't pick up the table tennis racket at all, I have to say. I just went brinjal, also because of the colour. Yeah. But um, I was wondering if, for example, the, the people who were embroidering this particular piece, maybe they just really liked brinjal. Uh, maybe. That looks like something out of a video game. Yeah, like I guess it's like also because it looks like the geometrical, like pixelated each yeah. stuff that you see in video games. But I guess maybe you could think of it like a frog. Yeah, that's kind of hopping away to yeah. get something. Another really like cool thing to look at, uh, this one, right? Hmm. What does that look like to you? So this kind of reminds me of uh, one of the things from one of the other episodes, the mm -hmm. one with the mica paintings. Um, there was the seller in that who was holding a similar rod with like uh, things on both ends. Yeah. I think if you look closer, you can think of these as kind of like small dolls or something. Oh. So maybe they like sell toys. Yeah, that's cool. 
I thought it was really weird because I thought there were people sitting in them. <laughs> but you know, there is a story about it, something to check out. Uh, there's an actual mythological tale about uh, his name is Shavan and he carries his parents like that. Oh wow. So, I mean, it could even be really a reference to that. Um, and then, of course, there's that. A tetrain. Right. Um, which is obvious. So, how old, is, how old is this then? So, this is from the early 20th century. Okay. Um, so early 1900s, let's say, and that would be a, a cool thing, right? At the time, um, trains would have been new. Right. It's new technology. It's amazing that it can take you across so much distance in so less a time. Mm. Um, and you see this in other textiles from that period in different forms as well, where these modern inventions that people saw around them started making their way into the designs and motifs, right? right. So if you think of this as a, as a group of women sitting and embroidering, um, for them the train would have been something that was now part of their life, something that they were fascinated by, um, and so it also finds its way into this piece. Right. That's cool. So, do all Fulkaris show like similar uh, tales from mythologies, people, animals, uh, or are there are Fulkalis that show other types of things. Actually, this is quite rare. Okay. So, this type of Fulkari is known as the Senchi Fulkari. Hmm. And it usually shows like village scenes. There are mostly just two types of Fulkaris that tend to show human figures. A lot of them focus on more geometric designs. Hmm. Um, maybe some flowers and floral stuff as well. And there are like several types of Fulkaris. So like I said, this one is called Senchi, but then you have what is known as a Bag Fulkari. Okay. So Bag means garden. And in those, you can't even see the base cloth. So what they do would embroider all over the cloth. So all you'll see is the embroidery. Like you'll only be able to see the base if you turn it around. There's the Chok Fulkari, which is known for these distinctive like triangular patterns okay. um, and is done on usually a, like a maroon base which is also the sign of like you know auspiciousness and so on right. um, so you have a whole bunch and they're all known for specific kinds of designs that's nice and so we talked about this piece being like from the early 20th century right yeah are full curries made even today in Punjab or anywhere are they still made yeah, very much so. Um, they are still made in Punjab. They're still very much a part of Punjabi weddings and things like that. Okay. Traditionally, the fulkaris were made like these, right? Like big mm. shawls. Mm. Um, but these days with like printed fulkaris, right. they use the patterns um, from them on all kinds of things. So you'll have like cushion covers, mm. you have bed sheets, duvet covers, that sort of stuff as well. It's nice to have seen so much detail in person because when I was when I was looking at all the the artworks in the museum site um, you couldn't really see it in very much detail yeah but like coming here is able it's nice to be able to look at you know the tech the texture all the details the vastness and just the one piece it's pretty cool I thought this full curry was a really playful piece that really made me think what does it make you think of? Also, if you're curious about what else I picked from the map collection, check out the other episodes in the series. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to make sure you get regular updates on all our ArtSparks videos. And also don't forget to follow us on our social media handles to stay updated with everything that MAP does. Thanks for watching. Bye.